Well, good evening. Good to see you all here tonight. I uh, hope everyone is having a blessed Lord's Day. hope it was encouraging. hope it was uplifting uh, so that we can get back into the world and serve our God and be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world and in our community. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark tonight. So if you'd like to take out your Bible and follow along with me, we're going to be in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. That's where the bulk of our lesson text is going to come from this evening. Uh, you know, in life, we've got, uh, we have these things that are often referred to as mountaintop experiences. Times in your life where life just, it's so good that it doesn't even seem real. We went on vacation several months ago back in April. We went to Gulf Shores, uh, Anna, and this was before Allison was born. Uh, but it didn't seem like life was real <laughs> at the beach. I got to go fishing every day I was there. I caught several pompano uh, and other ocean fish, and I just had the, the time of our life. It was a, a mountaintop experience. Um, when you get married and you go on the honeymoon, another mountaintop experience where life just doesn't seem very real. This time of year, Christmas time, uh, when we're giving gifts, when we're exchanging gifts uh, to, to one another, and, and there's just this atmosphere, there's this positive vibe, there's this positive atmosphere everywhere you go. You see all the Christmas lights and you, and you hear the Christmas music and it just makes you feel good, doesn't it? We have these mountaintop experiences in, uh, constantly in, in our life. But eventually, eventually, we come down from the mountain and real life happens. And real life happens. We get a really big dose of real life when we don't get our way. When things happen in our life that... Uh, didn't go according to plan or, or, or things that happened that, that uh, I didn't want to happen. I foresaw this happening and then the opposite happens. We come down from those times of elation and joy and experience real life. And it's in those times when we experience real life, uh, when we don't get our way, when we have an opportunity to express great faith or little faith. Great faith holds on to Jesus when it doesn't get its way. Little faith lets go of Jesus when it doesn't get its way. And we're going to see that tonight in our lesson text. We're going to look at a story of, about, of a time when Jesus heals a demon-possessed boy. And we're going to see that very truth in the pages of Scripture. So take out your Bible with me, if you will, and turn there. Turn to Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 14. Let's read verse, this is verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. Now, if you read... Previously, in the, in the book of Mark, the first uh, 13 verses of, of Mark chapter 9, you'll see the story of Jesus' transfiguration. Uh, we, we didn't uh, dive into that passage. Uh, we're um, not just skipping over it, but we're, just, we're, we're trying to get to, to, to this story. Uh, but if you look back, and you can probably read it while we're, while we're here, or read it on your, read it on your own time. Uh, but in that story, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, up on, up on a mountain. And they have kind of a, a, a mountaintop experience. And you can read about it in, in the text when it says Jesus was transfigured. Or another way that you could say that is he was transformed. The text says that his, uh, his clothes um, were, were like, it was like somebody had bleached them white. Um, he was, his face was glowing. He was, he was shining. Um, and, and the implication of that is that, it, 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 is that these, these, these disciples are getting a glimpse behind the curtain of who Jesus really is. Of Jesus' glory and his future retro resurrection glory um, that, uh, that is to be seen in, in, in the future. But they can't stay on the mountain 
They have to come down eventually from the mountaintop experience. And that's where we find ourselves in this story. In Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. Jesus and Peter and James and John, they come down, they descend from the mountain, and they come back to reality. And when they come down the mountain, they encounter this heated debate that's going on. Uh, there's this argument that's ensuing. Uh, some of the text says that there were some of the scribes that were arguing with the other nine disciples that, that, that were there. Uh, and they're, they're, the, the scribes and the disciples, they're, they're having this almost like sparring match, uh, this, this debate with uh, each, e each other. And this crowd has gathered and they're listening to Jesus' nine disciples and the scribes just going back and forth over a certain issue. Uh, let's keep reading in our text and see what that issue was in verse 15. And immediately, one of Mark's favorite words, all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you. For he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and he grinds his teeth. And he becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they weren't able. So in our text, apparently, we see here uh, the argument that's going on. Uh, apparently, it was centered around this demon-possessed boy. Um, that uh, Jesus, that that this man, that the father of the demon possessed boy, come to Jesus on his behalf, on, on his behalf, asking him to heal him. Uh, apparently, uh, and, and the text doesn't specifically say this, but I think it says this by implication. Um, I think this is implied uh, within the text that 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 the disciples tried to cast this demon out when Jesus and Peter and James and John were up on the mountain, and they weren't able to, and so the scribes see this as kind of an opportunity to discredit Jesus and his followers, like they've been trying to do all along, um, as we've seen in, in multiple stories so far. Uh, the Pharisees, the scribes, uh, they were trying to render Jesus a fool, a heretic, somebody that couldn't be trusted. And it's most likely that that's what they're doing in this case. It's most likely so that they're getting the crowd stirred up and saying, look, his disciples can't even perform this miracle. Jesus must not be the man that he claims to be. You know, the argument was probably most likely something like that, trying to destroy Jesus' reputation. Uh, now, notice here with me what the text says about the boy's condition. Look with me there. He says, the text says that the boy wasn't able to speak. He was mute. He wasn't able to verbally communicate because of uh, the demon with, within him. Uh, the text also says that the demon threw him down into this, into this like, uh, into these con convulsions, uh, very, very violent, um, in a very violent way. The text says that this poor boy foams at the mouth uh, like a rabid wild animal would. Uh, the text says that he grinds his teeth, uh, and perhaps it was because of the pain, maybe, that he was experiencing. Uh, Jesus says in other passages of Scripture, when he's describing hell, when he's describing eternal hell, Jesus says that it's a place uh, of weeping and gnashing of teeth, grinding of teeth. And the implication of that is because of the torment that exists within that place. And so we see kind of the same idea that this poor boy is experiencing through the oppression of this demon. He grinds his teeth, perhaps in pain, and it's like he's, he's paralyzed. He's, he's rigid. He can't hardly move. And if you keep reading in the text, you, you'll see that the demon at times even tries to kill him. He throws him in fire, throws him in water. There are fires, multiple fires everywhere. They use fires to heat their home with. They use fires to cook with. Uh, so uh, the demon would um, try to kill the boy 
um, by throwing him in one of those fires and, and, uh, and, and, and burning him to death and, and throwing him in water to, to, to drown him. So uh, try to put yourself um, in the shoes of the parents, especially the father that comes to Jesus and implores him to, to, to intervene in my child's life. Just imagine what this father is, is, is feeling. Uh, I mean, seeing your, your own son, the one that you, you love so dearly, experiencing all of these horrible things, and there's absolutely nothing that he can do about it. So the father is in, uh, is in, is in a horrible state. Um, he's in a state of, uh, he, he's just desperate. He's helpless. And he implores Jesus out of his de- desperation and his helplessness. And notice with me here Jesus' reply in verse 19. Look with me in verse 19. And he answered them, that's Jesus, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. Jesus essentially says here, as he has said multiple times throughout the Gospels, Oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. You can see. You can see my power and my authority and my compassion. But yet, you can't see. And you don't believe. You believe for a short time, you trust for a little while, and then when you don't get your way, or an obstacle comes, or something stands in the way of you getting what you want, then that faith and that belief, it vanishes away. It diminishes. Oh, you of little faith. And this is what happens next in verse 20. And they brought the boy to him, And when the Spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it's often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. And notice this. Notice what the father says here. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us. And help us. This father here, he's he's completely desperate. Completely helpless. And he casts himself at the feet of of Jesus. Uh, And and remember uh, what's already ensued within this story. Um, The father has already been a witness to the disciples. The nine disciples that have tried to cast this demon out. But were unsuccessful. Uh, and so it's most likely that the father is having kind of very, very maybe low confidence in, in, in Jesus' ability um, to, to cast this demon out because his disciples just tried to cast it out and they weren't able. Maybe Jesus isn't able to cast out the demon either. And he says, he says, if, he says, if you can do anything, if you can do anything, and the way that this reads, and you can see this, by the way, Jesus reacts to, to what he says in the next statement. He says this with kind of a hint of doubt uh, in Jesus' ability to be able to heal, heal his son. In, 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 other words, this, this is, in, in other words, this is what this man is saying. You know, things didn't really go my way the first time. The first time that my son was, was, was tried, tried, tried to, when he was tried to heal. So I'm not really sure if you have the power, if you have the authority, if you have the compassion to intervene in my life. And you know, it's, it's really easy. You, know, you look at stories of the, um, the faithlessness of the disciples and um, the, the doubt within this, this person. It's really easy for us to sit back in our pews and read the Bible and, and just beat up on these people. <laughs> uh, but uh, most often, you know, we can see ourselves through them. 
uh, when, when we read stories such, such as, as, as these, sometimes we do and say the same thing that this man said to Jesus. When things don't go our way, when an obstacle comes in, in, our, in our path and things don't go according to plan, sometimes we doubt, do we not? In God's ability, in God's compassion, if he's, if he's even, if he even cares... Or is he even there? Does he, does he even hear me? Does he even see the affliction that I am experiencing? Sometimes we can be the same way. And Jesus, he says this in verse 23. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. It's not a question of Jesus' ability to heal the boy. Just because things didn't go uh, the man's way the first time, that, that, uh, that just because things didn't go the way that the man had perceived them to go the, the first time, that doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't have the power and the authority and the compassion to heal this boy. It's not a question of Jesus' ability as we see through Jesus' reaction to this, it's a question of if the man believes. Do you believe? Do you believe? Do, do you believe despite the obstacles that you see? Do you believe despite the setbacks that are put in your way? Do you believe in Jesus' power and authority and compassion even when things don't go your way? That's the real question. It's not a question of, can Jesus do this? Can you, if you can, Jesus, if you can. It's, that's not the question. The question is, do you believe? Do you have faith? Do you believe that I can do this? Because all things, Jesus says, are possible for the one who believes. And then in verse 24, immediately... The father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. He essentially says, help me in my weakness. Help me in my doubt. Help me to overcome this, uh, th th this, this doubt that I have within my life. And the implication is because of that plea of desperation and casting himself at the feet of Jesus... Jesus does this in verse 25. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never again enter him. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. Jesus healed the boy. He intervened in, 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 in his life, and he makes him, make, makes him well. Now, I want us to notice uh, the, one of the main points that, I, that I'm trying to make through this. I want us to notice uh, the, the next verse, uh, the last two verses, verse 28 and 29, uh, when Jesus has a small conversation with his disciples. After this event, look with me in verse 28 because he tells his disciples something very important, and not only to his disciples, but us as well. In verse 28, and when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Okay, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. What does that mean? What does Jesus' statement mean? What is, he getting, what is he getting at? The disciples asked him, Jesus, what, I mean, we've, we've done this before, and, and it didn't work this time. Like, what, what's the deal? Why couldn't we, why, why couldn't we cast out the the demon. And Jesus' reply was 
this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Now, what it doesn't mean, uh, of course, is that this was some kind of uh, weird demon that they hadn't encountered before that they needed prayer to cast out. Uh, the other ones didn't need prayer, but this one, you got to have prayer. you got to pray to cast this demon out because this is a different kind of demon. Uh, well, that's not what Jesus is saying, of course. Um, that's, that's not what Jesus is trying to get at. So, so what, is, what does it mean? What is, what is Jesus trying to get at? Um, I, I think going over to Matthew's account helps us uh, with, with, with understanding this question. Um, in Matthew chapter 17, verses 19 through 20, we see the, the same account here. And Matthew gives us a little more information. Matthew chapter 17, verses 19, 19 through 20. It says, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And Jesus gives them a reason. And here's the reason. He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So why couldn't they cast it out? What does Matthew say? Or what does Jesus say in Matthew's account? Jesus, Jesus says it was because of their little faith. O oh, you of little faith, your doubt, your disbelief in my power and authority and, 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 and compassion was the reason why you weren't able to cast out this demon. Uh, what's implied here uh, is that when the disciples weren't able to cast out the demon the first time, they just kind of threw their hands up in the air and said, well, now what? Now what? I mean, we can't do this. We might as well just go home. They didn't say that, but um, that was just me throwing that in there. So when, when Jesus says this kind, this kind of demon, it cannot be driven out by anything but prayer, this is what he's essentially saying. He's saying, guys, when the demon didn't come out, you should have stayed on your knees. You should have stayed on your knees and depended upon God, depended upon me. But instead, when things didn't go your way, you forgot about my power and my authority and my compassion. O oh, you of little faith. The disciples, what the text says to us is that they didn't hold on to Jesus when things didn't go their way. They weren't on their knees praying in full dependence and reliance upon God. But they, like the man with the demon-possessed boy, doubted in God's ability and Jesus' ability to cast out the demon. So, what's the lesson? What are, we, what, what are we trying to get at here? Um, how does this help us to, uh, to live in love like Jesus? Um, because that's what, we're, that's, what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, trying to be like Jesus. We're trying to um, be his hands and his feet in this world. Uh, what, what's the lesson in this? What, 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 what can we draw from this? I, I think this is one of the major lessons that this story teaches us. Great faith, great faith, it holds on to Jesus when it doesn't get its way. When obstacles arise, when setbacks come, when things don't go according to plan, faith, great faith, holds on and trusts and depends and looks to God even in those times of maybe even heartache and sorrow. Looks to God and depends upon Him more than anything else and holds on. That's great faith. And little faith, 
little faith, it lets go. It lets go of Jesus when it doesn't get its way, when obstacles come, when setbacks arise, when things don't go according to plan. It lets go and doesn't trust and doesn't fully depend and doesn't cast itself at the feet of Jesus. And that's what we see, I believe, in, in uh, the th- three primary groups within the story. We see the scribes, um, and of course they were, they were ones that had a, an, an, a certain expectation of what the Messiah was going to be like. But when Jesus didn't fit that, when an obstacle arose in their path, they let go. They let go. Oh, we're also introduced to the man with, with the demon-possessed boy. When his, son, when his son wasn't healed the first time, and he began to lose confidence uh, in, in Jesus' power and his, and his compassion, he let go <laughs> and displayed little faith. And we also see the disciples, when they weren't able to cast out the demon. And they were kind of frustrated about it. Instead of remaining on their knees and praying in full reliance and dependence upon God's power and God's ability to intervene in their life, they disbelieved. That's what Matthew tells us in Matthew chapter 17. O you of little faith. Great faith. Great faith holds on to Jesus when it doesn't get its way. And little faith lets go when it doesn't get its way. And we know that in the Christian life, um, things aren't going to go your way (laughs) a lot of the time. You are going to experience obstacles. You are going to experience setbacks. And um, times when... You're at your wit's end, and, and, and you, you're tempted to look up to God and say, God, I mean, this isn't going the way that I thought it would go. You'll face times like that in the Christian life. And it's in those times when you have an opportunity to express either great faith or little faith. Great faith holds on to Jesus and sees Him as more valuable than anything, even when it doesn't get its way. And little faith lets go of Jesus when obstacles happen and things get in the way. The lesson is yours tonight. If there's anyone that uh, needs to respond to the gospel call, the gospel still stands... Uh, Jesus Christ lives and reigns, has died for the sins of many. Uh, If you don't know Jesus, then uh, throw yourself at His feet tonight by believing in Him and repenting of your sins. And You can come forward in just a moment and confess uh, your newfound faith in Him and and be immersed in the waters of baptism uh, and begin a relationship with Him. Uh, If you have any need uh, tonight, why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing.